We are not left-wing or right-wing. We are classical liberal. We are not conservative either. And we are independent. We are the Center for Independent Studies. We're independent from government. We are not taking um, commissioned research. We are not a consultancy. And we're trying to apply classical liberal thinking to policy questions. I'm not surprised at all that uh, young people are more likely to vote Greens because young people are always tending to the left. I mean, it's been like this for, I think, at least 50 or 60 years. There is a saying, of course, that if you're growing up and you're young and you're not a lefty, you have no heart. But if you're then growing up and older and you're not turning into a right winger, then you have no brains. Now, with all due respect, I'm not, I'm not saying that you either need to grow up or you don't have any brains, but um, I, I think that seems to be a normal progression. And I can still remember telling you a secret now. I once voted Social Democrat. <laughs> Progressive, very simply, is about positive social and economic change. And its counterpoint is not libertarian or not free market. Its counterpoint is really conservative. And, and to me, you can see kind of in, in the word itself, it, that's about conserving the status quo. And, you know, there's just a, a different view on kind of the ability of societies to evolve and to improve and to get better versus, you know, taking the status quo and seeking to maintain it. Maybe I'm just a bit confused here, but um, I think what you're trying to do is you're trying to get away from the old labels. You don't want to be a social democrat anymore, you don't want to be a socialist anymore, and so you're calling yourself progressive. Now, I think that doesn't quite uh, capture it, um, because I think, I mean, what does it mean if, you're, if you two are progressives? Does that mean that I'm a Steinzeit Stein Neanderthal? Uh, <laughs> um, or am I regressive? Uh, am I hardly alive anymore? <laughs> I don't know. Um, no, you've, I, told I actually, us, you've told us yeah. very clearly, Oliver, you're, you're independent and libertarian. I'm happy to accept that. Perfect. But I'm progressive as well, because I want progress. David and I, we often appear together on radio, and he's always introduced as the guy from the progressive think tank. And that sounds all very positive. And then come I, and uh, it's always from that libertarian think tank. You can call yourself whatever you like. <laughs> progressive. But, but, but progressive is complete rubbish. I'm sorry. It has no intellectual basis whatsoever. Um, it's about the idea that we can create a fairer society. We all believe in a fairer society. But define fair. It's a grab bag of things based on what you think matters at any given time. You look at the world as though it's a dashboard of dials that can be tweaked to come up with a more perfect equilibrium. It's crap. <laughs> okay, I'm going I'm to move on. And I see consistently uh, equal opportunities of justification to erode the concept of responsibility and for people to take responsibility for their lives. And, um, so I'm not a, a big fan of the, the movement. Okay. I'm not a big fan either because I think uh, freedom of contract is a, a valuable thing in society and we all discriminate on a daily basis. I discriminated uh, against a number of occasions tonight because I wanted to be here, so I have to make decisions. I have to discriminate. And the same should be true in all other markets too, in the employment market, in, uh, in product markets. I think we have to discriminate. We have to keep freedom of contract alive because otherwise it's a meaningless concept. And when we're talking about equality, I mean, I've seen equality at work and it looked very grey and everybody was driving a Trabant and it was called East Germany. <laughs> I'm getting a bit irritated when I hear the word market failure because I'm not, never quite sure what you mean. Market failure in economic theory has a very clear meaning, and it means uh, that the market simply doesn't equate. It doesn't come together. But what you mean when you say market failure is something completely different. What you mean by market, no, 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 market failure? What you mean by market failure is when the market doesn't produce the result that you want to see, Correct. and that's a different story. No, that's true. That's not true. It's, it's we reckon tax is an investment in a in a future, prosperous, cohesive society. So you're saying I don't invest enough? <laughs> I have a bit of a problem with these surveys because I don't quite trust them. Because whenever you ask people whether they think that climate change is something that needs to be addressed, they say, yeah, of course, sure. And then you ask them, uh, do you want to pay a carbon tax? And they say, no, mm, probably not. <laughs> and you get the same question um, on, on road uh, charging, for example. I remember there were surveys in Britain when I worked there um, that people said that uh, more investment needs to be made into public transport and transport generally. And then you ask them, whether they supported road pricing, of course, I said no. And the same problem here, I think, in the Australian tax service, whenever you ask people whether government should collect a bit more so they could spend it on education and health and all the good things we can all agree on, uh, they say, yeah, sure, that should be done. And then you ask them, do you want to pay more taxes? And they say, no, other people should. <laughs> and I think uh, it's that kind of um, wash me but don't wet me attitude. Yeah, yeah. So um, I don't trust surveys when you ask taxpayers whether they want to pay more taxes or whether other people should pay more taxes. Right. Of course the others should pay more taxes. <laughs> I'll just try to I think it matters um, how you design that scheme for organ donations, for example. We all know that we have waiting lists for organs. We have waiting lists for kidneys, for hearts, and so on. I think an easy way to deal with that would actually be to have a system where you pre-commit to, to donate your organs, and that would give you a higher place on that list should you need one yourself. 
I think that's a nice idea. Yeah, that's, and being, that's being tried in Israel at the moment. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's the kind of uh, approach you can take to organizing these markets. The problem I have with an any state is not so much when I think of problem gamblers. I, know, I think we, we can all agree that there are people in society who are vulnerable. And I happen to work um, in a, an institution for mentally uh, disabled people when I um, didn't join the German army, but I did something useful. <laughs> and um, I, I've met these people, and I met people who can't make their own decisions, and we have to protect them. And uh, there is no pure ideological libertarian solution to that, and I, I'm happy to admit that. What I have a problem with, though, is uh, that we treat the whole rest of society, the other 99%, as if they're pathologically stupid to make their own decisions. In a recent report, you argued that Australia has succeeded in, in, its multi, in multiculturalism and in integrating immigrants because it selects, it's very highly selective in choosing ambitious and qualified migrants who are eager to integrate into Australia. What I'd like to, well, feel free to um, extend your argument if you like, but what I'd really like to ask is the panel, do you agree with this immigrant meritocracy and then how do you feel about refugees? Yeah, of course. I mean, it works here. You get uh, extremely well-qualified German economists entering the country. <laughs> <laughs> Although I'm here on a family visa. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, what really triggered it, we had a big debate in Europe in recent years over the failure of multiculturalism. And uh, I think there is good evidence, statistical evidence, to back that claim up that multiculturalism in Europe is failing. Because if you look at, for example, unemployment rates of migrants in, in, in Germany or in, in France or in Britain, you can see that they are usually higher than that of the native-born population. You can also see that they, are, they tend to be more welfare dependent. You can see that uh, migrants' children, for example, in Germany, um, lag behind uh, German children by about t two years in, on average in school testings. And then you look at Australia and you see that basically all these problems don't exist here. Because our migrants, on average, do better in the labor market. They are less welfare dependent, and their children do better at school. So there must be some reason for that. Now, some people say Australia is a very welcoming country. And yep, that's probably true. Some say it's probably doing something better on immigration and integration policy. And I think that's not quite so true, because when you look at the integration programs of Australian governments, they're doing exactly the same what the Europeans are doing. So where is the difference? And I think the difference really is that Australia has a point system. It's really trying to select these migrants extremely carefully, and you know how it works. They have to speak English. They have to bring qualifications to Australia. And then what this means, in effect, is you're bringing in middle-class people who are educated. But you take the same middle-class people educated and put them into any other country, and they become good Chileans or good Polish or good Germans or good British. It doesn't matter because they almost integrate themselves, whereas European countries in the past have not had that point system, so they took whoever came. And of course, these people have different problems. So I think one of the reasons why Australian multiculturalism works so well it's because these people have basically integrated themselves. It's not because we did some great integration programs for them. It's just because we took the right people who fit in and who have the potential to make a difference in Australia and to really become successful people and successful migrants in this country. And I think this is where Australian multiculturalism and European multiculturalism are completely different. I might just jump straight to the refugee question. Um, an argument that... I'm not talking about refugees, by the way. Yeah. It's a completely well, different category. But I, I just find that refugees tend to be very enterprising, um, you know, like they've taken that initiative to get themselves out of the situation they were in rather than sitting there and putting up with it. They'll be active citizens. Um, and I would actually argue on that basis and, and we should increase the proportion of refugees in that's the immigrant That's all wonderful. The, the problem with refugees is when refugees do not try to make a difference, when they don't try to enter the labour market, but when they go straight into the welfare state. Correct. So, Oliver, what was your very quick summary of your funny idea? Look, um, we all know that we should uh, cut red tape, and we've tried it before with uh, num numerous different schemes, and it never really worked because uh, we all know that bureaucracy is always growing. So I had a wonderful idea, and I want to share it with you now. <laughs> so the idea is... Uh, we all think that an emissions trading scheme, in theory at least, can work to cut pollution. Now, what is bureaucracy but pollution, right? So we issue red tape certificates to polluters. <laughs> the polluters are, of course, ministries and departments and bureaucracies. And so what we do, we just measure how much pollution there is, how much red tape there is in the economy. And then afterwards, we issue red tape certificates. But we only issue 90% of the current level. And then we let these government uh, bureaucrats trade with each other and <laughs> drive down pollution. I think it's a wonderful idea, and I think our left-wing colleagues should support it. <laughs> Do you really want to have to comply to eight, nine different sets of Do you want to? Yes. No, but, but it's a situation. Mary? Look, look, no, 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 sorry, sorry, sorry. 
but when you're actually comparing that, think of Switzerland. Switzerland is seven and a half million people in 26 different cantons. It's extremely small scale. They've got 26 cantons. They've got 2,900 independent communities, and yet they collect taxes at, in, in each of these different cantons and each of these different communities. They have different building regulations and so on, and Switzerland actually works quite well because they've got the competition. If you don't like it in St. Gallen, you go to Zurich. Correct. I'm generally in favour of reducing. I'd be happy in St. Gallen. Bar. I could live in St. Gallen. I take Hold Zurich. <laughs> what stage would you accept that the free market as an ideology is flawed? I think um, when we're looking at the market crisis, I mean, you're looking at the, the core of the crisis now. The core is Europe, and the core problem in Europe is that you have governments that are over indebted because they spend too much. That's got nothing to do with the free market. When the free market now decides, or capital markets decide, that they don't want to lend to these over indebted governments anymore, that's not a crisis of capitalism, that's a crisis of social democracy. Because these but governments the have. The US is in the same position. Hang on, hang on, hang on. You wouldn't argue it is a social democracy. Okay, well, then let's talk about the US. I think it is a disaster that uh, you now have a position where you try to. Uh, Inflate your way. Well, no, hey. I think the, the real crisis is that we're trying to get away from uh, the uh, connection between risk and liability. If you are taking risk, if you are happy to make a killing in markets, that's all fine. But you shouldn't really uh, go to your government afterwards and say, uh, can you please bear me out of things go pear-shaped. I think we really have to come back to fundamental free market rules for engagement in markets. And that is, if you're taking a risk, you have to stick to it, whether that investment fails or succeeds. I think we are not experiencing a cri crisis of free market capitalism. We're actually seeing more of that kind of um, government meddling with um, the free market process, because I think we should actually let this crisis run its course in America, let a few financial institutions go bankrupt. And in that sense, I'm completely with the Occupy movement, because <laughs> I think uh, when they uh, protest against governments continually bailing out uh, broke financial institutions that risk too much, I'm with them. I think we have to restore capitalism. We should let this crisis run its course. And isn't the whole euro crisis just a perfect example of what happens when you let the state run affairs? I must say that I've seen quite a few of my proposals uh, being implemented now. Um, part of the uh, work on housing that I did in the UK um, is now being undertaken by the Cameron government. Uh, the um, government in Britain now has a new um, advisory body for fiscal policy that was also one of our initiatives. Even my red tape trading scheme is now being trialed in a shire here. So... <laughs> Uh, occasionally it happens. Now, the thing I, I, I believe with think tanks is, um, in a way, we are completely unnecessary. Um, we are necessary because there are so many academic economists in Australia that if they did their jobs properly, we wouldn't be needed. And we would be completely unnecessary, too, if the government only read the reports from the Productivity Commission. But of course, governments do, don't do that, and academic economists don't publish in newspapers because uh, they don't get anything out of that. And so, probably, we are still needed. I still remember the case uh, in Britain a few results. years ago where primary school children were not even allowed to fail anymore. Yeah. Teachers were told to tell them that it was just some kind of deferred success. <laughs> <laughs> we are not affiliated. We're talking to everybody who wants to listen to us, and that's fine. And if you're asking me why politicians uh, don't listen to ideas coming out of our four brilliant institutions, well, the problem is I think the political process is now driven by something else. It's not driven by ideas. It's driven by short-termism. It's driven by focus groups, and it's driven by opinion polls. And I actually think, and we discussed this yesterday on the radio, I think even lefties now are now yearning back for the times of John Howard because you may have... <laughs> You may have disagreed with him, you may not have liked the guy, but I, I, I guarantee you, you could have woken him up at 3 a.m. and asked him any question about domestic or international affairs, and he would have told you precisely where he stood. Nowadays, you wake up Julia Gillard or Tony Abbott, for that matter, and I think they will first have to consult with their advisors and see the latest polling results. And I think that's a major problem. We need to have politicians who really know what they are up for. And I think... Leading it back to the whole question of whether we should be ideological or whether we should just be, uh, you know, evidence-based, I think in the end you need both. Of course, you shouldn't be blind to evidence, but if you're blind to evidence, you can't make good policies, and you will just just be a pure ideologue. Ideologue, but if you're completely without any ideas, and if you really don't know um, what you are all up for and what you believe in, 
then everything is just uh, empty pragmatism driven by the latest opinion polls and uh, perhaps determined by the last person you just talked to. I think we need both. We need empiricism, we need good evidence, but we also need ideologies. I'm a defender of ideology because I think they are vital. I think what Australia needs is not less ideology, but more. And I would like to see it on both sides. I would like to have really vigorous debates, both sides battling it out, let them be pure ideologues, but at least you know what they are up for and what they stand for. That's what we need. And I think we have had enough of these bland politicians who can't even tell you whether they are going to believe in the same idea that they believed in the morning at 6 p.m. <laughs>